But we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, the lobby. If you are here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and content that otherwise only our patrons get. All right, not a lot going in chat tonight. We were talking a bit about tacos earlier, and we're talking about Spotify and what's going on with um, Google Music going away and how that's going to impact everything. But not a lot of gaming discussion, so I think we're probably going to skip past this and get into the next uh, next segment pretty quickly tonight. So tonight, we are back to providing you with some game recommendations. So specifically, this week, we're looking at games that surprise Sean or I in some way by being much more than we expected them to be. And as we do for all of these game recommendation style episodes, we will be looking back to the lobby or chat room to point out any games we missed or games they know about that we don't. And we will be checking in later in the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions is to come through that website. That way they get logged and tracked and end up on a nice Excel spreadsheet for me to look at. But I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere online. Well, this week we have a question from a longtime fan of our show with us since the beginning, Prayerborn, who wrote in to say, I've actually thought before that an interesting discussion topic would be surprisingly advanced games. Hmm? Older games with mechanics we think of as recent inventions, or even newer games that are gamier than we expect. Mass-marketed Hunger Games District 12 is a Euro? All right, thanks for the topic, Prayerborn. Uh, I, I feel bad. We've had this one on the pile for a while, but we're finally getting to it. We did get to it. I do apologize. It might have taken a little while. Uh, this is an interesting one, and it's definitely something I have experienced, right? You sit down to play a game expecting one thing, and end up with something completely different, right? Now, sometimes the thing that's different is the game's worse than you expected, or it does, or which which doesn't seem as common, or like it just does something totally new that you never expected to see before, or it just is is heavier. It just it's much more than you thought it would be. Whether it's just more fun, it does some cool new thing, or it uses things you've seen before in new ways, or it has more interactions or more options than expected. Basically more, as Prayerborn worded it, more gamier. It's, it's more of a gamer's game than you would have ever thought it could be. Now, this happens to me most often probably with mass market games or licensed board games, because for many, many years, if there was a licensed game, it was a license thrown on a terrible, probably roll and move, miss a turn or trivia game. Uh, that's thankfully changing. But I've also had hobby games where they've completely blown me away as well. And while I can certainly think of many, many negative examples to this topic, there are definitely some standout games that have made me do a double take. Yeah, we're gonna be we're gonna be looking at the positive side of things. We're not looking at games that were disappointing to us. We're looking for we're looking at stuff that surprised us in a good way. Now I gotta say, what happens for here? It's sometimes I'll find this on my own, right? Like I, I do a lot of research before purchasing a game or even before like asking for a review copy from uh, publishers. And I tend to not get games that I don't expect to like. So it, every now and then it happens where, where something's different than I expect it to be. But more often it's hype, right? It's the buzz. It's the, it's the internet hype. It's the pod, pod catchers, uh, Tom Vassell, the, the YouTubers, the content creators like us who will point out a game that most people will overlook. Like a good example of this is, uh, look, like Prayerborn said, Hunger Games District 12 is a Euro? Like seriously, there's a Hunger Games game out there that, that's a Euro game. Like not, not an Ameritrash, not a Dice Chucker. Like serious, I would have never looked at a Hunger Games game. Now I'll have to admit, I haven't checked this one out, but I'm curious now to see how, how good this game is. Yeah, young adult uh, mass market dystopian fiction isn't exactly where one would expect to mine for deep and thoughtful content in general, let alone in the board yeah. game aftermarket. <laughs> yeah, it's true enough. Like, there, there were so many bad mass market games. But anyway, we're, we're going to talk about positive things here. So on, on to the list. So these are all games that surprised us in some way. Um, the Prayerborn specifically said more complicated. These aren't all necessarily more complicated, but just that we're more or better than we expected. And I'm going to start off with one that, that just because when I was uh, working on the show notes, I was thinking about that hype, right? That internet hype, the, the buzz. And one of the games that I would have never touched 
is medium. And the only reason I dug into that is that was considered the game of Gen Con 2019. Now, I didn't intend Gen Con 2019, but after Gen Con 2019, everyone was talking about medium. Like, Twitter was a buzz with medium. The podcasts I listened to were a buzz. Like, oh, did you play medium? Oh, we played medium. And oh, at after hours, we played medium. Everyone was talking about medium. So I actually went myself and contacted the publishers and said, I have heard such good things about this game. It would be awesome if you could do a, re if, if you would send us a review copy. And I'd also like to do a giveaway because, well, the hype was huge. And we got it. And I'm like, what the heck is this? Like, like, I'm going to throw a card down and you're going to throw a card down and we're going to try to say the word in between. And this is supposed to be fun. And then we played it the first time and the amount like this was Telestration's level of laughter happening that first time with my Monday night group of uh, generally Euro players, right? Like, like, I, I don't know if I call them hardcore gamers, but definitely like experienced gamers laughing our butts off with this silly game where we're just trying to say the same word together. So that is definitely my, my, my number one on the list. These aren't in any particular order, but that was one that was a complete surprise. Yeah, no, Medium was 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 definitely that that for me. Um, I had sort of went, yeah, yeah, that'll be amusing. Uh, and then the first time, uh, D and I actually yep. uh, sat down and 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 put two cards down, and words left her brain, uh, yeah. <laughs> and and there was, she was unable to speak, uh, mm -hmm. just because it was that, and it was just that sort of thing, and and the laughter just just kept going. So uh, so that was Medium. All right, next um, goes to the Windsor Comic Con, where we were there with uh, the CG Realm, a local game store, and we were there to promote our Extra Life event and try to raise some money. And as part of it, Jeremy, the owner of the store, had donated this new game that he swore was going to be hot. And it was a game from the Funko Pop people with little Funko Pops in it. And it was the Harry Potter version. And I've said this before on the show, I am not a Potterhead. That's something that came out after, long after I, well, I still read books, but like I wasn't reading young adult fiction, that's for sure. Um, something my kids love. So I have no, and, and Pops never did anything for me. Although I have seen some cool ones like the Gelatinous Cube one. So I was like, what the heck's this game? Why are people going to care that much? And, and I just figured people would care because it's Harry Potter and Pops. So at that event, Jeff, uh, Jeff Seuss, fan of the show, patron of the show, and I were there doing demos. And we sat down and I flipped through the rule book and I read how to do this. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. This is like, this is like a, a, I don't know, a Warhammer game. Like this is a miniature skirmish battle game with relatively complex rules. Like that you have different movement points and everyone it's asymmetric. Everyone's unique and they have different spells and the spells have different cooldown values and there's different scenarios. So you can play King of the Hill or you can play capture the flag or you can play like a football like game. I was blown away by how good a game this was, which seems like other people have figured this out too. Like this is one where I got home and scrapped everything we were going to talk about on the podcast the next week and scrapped what review I was going to write to write about this game because I felt gamers needed to know that there was a game here. I, the, 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 all of, like, I only played the Harry Potter one, but they're all compatible. They all use the same rules. This is literally a miniature war game, a skirmish, skirmish war game. Carol Hall, the designers, have confirmed it was actually made by hardcore skirmish war gamers, sat down and went, how can we make an intro-level war game? that that fits with the pop theme of just fun yeah no i i still haven't gotten a funko uh onto the table and again i never i never got the funko pop mystique yeah. there it, i don't understand how there are however many thousand different pops and why people collect them like candy but i mean they're obviously a thing and then to all of a sudden have this become a game um now again because it, of of who Funko's gaming department is we we sort of understand that a little better you know now but, now, but uh at the time it was a complete shock uh, to yeah, see it baffling come out. yeah and that was the funko verse games all right up next is hamster roll this is one of probably my favorite all-time favorite dexterity games that and pitch car fight back and forth but you know what i get hamster roll to the table more often so based on the bellhops law it has to beat out pitch car in that and what it is hamster rolls this big wooden hamster wheel with slats on it and you're stacking blocks on it. And it's a, it's a dexterity game, right? And when you see it, you're like, yeah, this is a fun dexterity game. But what blows me away about this game is the fact that there is a lot of tactics and possibly even some strategy, like planning multiple moves ahead and picking which blocks to place, where to put them, 
And then there's that the the evolution of gameplay where you realize another part of the game is looking what the next player has to place. So you look at what pieces your opponents have left and then try to make your placement make theirs more difficult. Having all that in a simple stacking game blows me away. Yeah, no, absolutely. Hamster Roll is one of, if not my, you know, one of my top favorite dexterity games. Uh, and especially because where you play it matters just as yeah. much as who you play it with or, or anything else. The actual surface that you're playing on becomes a part of the game, mm -hmm. um, for better or worse, depending on uh, what kind of a table you're on. Uh, and that was Hamster Roll. Uh, now, up, up next, we've got Go Cuckoo. Mm -hmm. And this is one that really jumped out of nowhere at us. It was uh, mm -hmm. Moe and D at Origins. Uh, and who was it who, who kind of was demanding that you try this uh, silly game? Pa patron of the show, Wayne, the Star Wars guy, Humphrey. There we go. Wayne, Wayne, so Wayne Humphrey had this game that everyone had to try and everyone had to try. And, and really, you open it up and it, the, your first thought is, you're actually going to get me to play pickup sticks? I mean, yep. really? Come on. Because that's what they are. They are literally just pickup sticks. But then you realize, no, no, the container, the whole, the, 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 the container of the game is part of the game. And you start experimenting. And the first time you play it, it's like, oh, this is silly. And then you realize, oh, wait, or, you know, someone will do something that you haven't seen done before. And you, your brain opens up to more possibilities. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you've gone from a simple game where you're just trying to lean sticks against each other and balance an egg on it to evolving this giant mesh of sticks extending far out from the actual, you know, small little container in the middle uh, and, and you know, testing your knowledge of physics and balance yes. uh, in, in a massive, you know, hard thinking game with swearing and cursing and, 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 you know, people throwing tantrums because, you know, something rolled a little bit too far as they gently put their egg down and there was sweat on their fingers it is amazing. And uh, that was Go Cuckoo, a game released for Haba by Haba for kids for Easter about what 2016 or 2017. This isn't a new one. Yep. All right. One that surprised me. Now, this is another one. Uh, podcasters got me hyped about this. Everyone was talking about this game, and I probably would have completely skipped over it. Uh, that is Ravensburgers Horrified. I hate to admit it. I've admitted already I haven't seen Jaws. I, this is just proof of it. I, I am not a horror fan. Even old school black and white classic. I have not seen a single movie that is featured in the game Horrified. I've not seen Dracula, Frankenstein and his Bride, or the creature from the, the black, the whatever colored lagoon, from the lagoon, whatever color it is, or the Invisible Man. I've never seen any of those. The, the universal monsters were not something I grew up with. But, so I didn't care about this game. Plus, it just it, it's a mass market it's got miniatures that kind of look like plastic army men they're not all that detailed just didn't do anything for me but everyone was going on about how this game's so good and the one comment that is better than pandemic i kept hearing better than pandemic better co-op than pandemic and longtime fans of the show know i'm not a big fan of pandemic but i do dig good co-op games and i'm always looking for the better than pandemic that i can break out when i roast a game night and people are like can we please play pandemic and i'm like i gotta find anything else i can suggest because i am not a fan of pandemic and there we have horrified which is an amazing game it's actually a co-op pick up and deliver game which you probably wouldn't realize until you played it a couple times that's got completely different styles of play depending on which monsters you face and it's scalable like if you want to play with your kids just throw one monster down if you want to challenge yourself throw down four or five we've never beaten five four no, once out of all the times we've tried uh this is a game uh because of all the different things going on and the fact that characters have different powers and different cards you don't get the quarterbacking as much as you do in games like pandemic it can happen but we found it's not that much i i am a huge fan of this game this is one that I got a review copy um, and I expected to review it, go, yeah, okay, it's neat. It's it's a bit better than Pandemic and pass it on. And I plan on keeping this one. Yeah, no, it was interesting because I remember the unboxing uh, and it was, you know, great quality. And we were really impressed by, you know, well, this is the stuff that's coming out. Uh, even the way that one page was, there was a one page presented right on the top of the, the, oh, the yeah. label on the back of the, the board that was mm -hmm. presented as you open the box. They really did a great job presenting it. And, 
it, it felt a lot like it was going to be that sort of flash in the pan. Look, this is this looks fantastic. It looked great on the table, and then we're never going to play it again. And then we sat down and started playing yeah. it. And, and it was it was great. And the only concern I really have about that game is the potential for quarterbacking. Yeah. But other than that, and, you know, as long as you've got a good group who are willing to cooperate and, and, and not, you know, be overbearing in that way, it is a fantastic game. And that was Horrified. All right, this is another surprise one. This is a complete surprise. King me. I uh, got this one from Ravensburger, uh, basically on a whim. The Ravensburg, we had a problem with one of Ravensburg's products. I wrote and complained about this product, and in return for uh, not being able to fix the problem I had, they sent us some free games. So, thumbs up on um, like customer support there, Ravensburger. You did awesome. This wasn't a review thing, and what it was is I basically they said we could pick like you can get a number of games, and I started going through their catalog, and I own most of the good ones, right? And I'm like, huh, I don't know. And I'm looking through and I'm like, I don't know, how about King Me, right? So we kind of picked it randomly. And I looked at it, I'm like, what, like, what is this? It? It's, it's supposed to have improved checkers. Like, come on, it's tried and true checkers. What are you going to do with this? And then it showed up and I did an unboxing video with my daughter, which was kind of fun. And I started seeing it and I'm like, whoa, this board's like broken into all different areas. And then we looked at the cards and I sat down and read the rules. And I'm like, wow, they turned checkers into an area majority game where having your parts, your, your, uh, checkers i guess in different parts of the board at different time of the game are going to score you points that's brilliant and then added to that they had a really interesting rule for kinging and how much kings are points and like this game seriously like, like this is a game which is still happening because of the pandemic but i want to play char like this is on that that chess level i think you could get there in this game like th this is something that like anyone who likes checkers if you're a fan has to play this because this really does improve checkers and even if you're not this is so much cooler than checkers just by having to get your pieces in the right spot at the right time and you also get points for capturing your opponents and you also get points for kinging really solid game like this one like completely out of nowhere i i thought we were getting some cheap checkers knocked off and we, instead we got an awesome evolution of checkers well that was king me all right, Camel Up is my next one. And yes, Camel Up, not Camel Cup, though I think in the new edition they kind of made it so it's easier to read. Uh, a dice-based racing game with silly-looking camel meeples that supposedly can stack on top of each other. What, that, that doesn't seem that cool to me. This is one I literally did not care until playing it at a game night with, I think it plays up to 10 people. It's 8 or 10 people. It's a big group. So it's either eight or 10 people, whatever it was. And my God, everyone had so much fun, like laughing and challenging. Like there's two things that, that make this a killer app. That's this game. Um, first off is the fact that it's a racing game where you don't own a camel. So it's not a racing game where you're trying to get your camel to win. You're basically betting on which camel is going to come in first and which camel is going to come in last, as well as which camel is going to be ahead every round. And that every round bet is, is brilliant because it keeps you interested the whole race. And then there's the whole camel up part where when the meeples move on top of each other and the bottom one moves, they all move with it. That like the, the trying to figure out the odds in that game blows my brain. And I've done it where I sat there going, okay, it's a die three. If you roll a three, you're going to go there. But if you pull the blue die, this one's going to go out. Like it's just so much going on in that game, probability wise that affects those bets. So it's a fantastic game. I was blown away by this. That was one of those games where I played it at that game night at the game store and bought a copy before leaving. Cause I'm like, I got to bring this home. Yeah. That was camel up. Uh, I, I've played that one at the party, uh, a couple of parties and uh, you know, it's just an enjoyable group game. You can all sort of, you know, have a, you know, stand around while, uh, while you're having a drink and, uh, and play. Now, next up we have build Microsoft or mine. Wow. Microsoft, <laughs> Minecraft builders and biomes, which and Minecraft is technically owned by Microsoft. There uh, you go. Now, especially when compared to the card game that I had originally had, which is a Minecraft branded card game, and was absolutely horrific. Uh, it didn't even get the basic Minecraft facts right, um, as well as just being a really boring card game. Now. We got this game, and we weren't sure what to expect, but it was one of those things. You know, I'm a big Minecraft fan. My family's a big Minecraft fan. So I actually reached out to uh, the people at Mojang, uh, and they gave us a contact uh, and, and uh, got Ravensburger involved, and that's what got us the, the review copy. And we did the unboxing. It was interesting, but 
nothing really outstanding. I think with the with the, when it came to the unboxing, you know, a bunch of cards, some boards. The cubes were nice. The cubes, the, the cubes were very nice. The yeah. yeah, they're the the Teotihuacan sort of uh, si- or not Teotihuacan, um, um, Imhotep. Imhotep uh, cubes. Yeah, very nice. Uh, and then we sat down and we played the game, and realized, oh wait, there's 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 some depth here. And then we played the uh-huh. game again and went, wow. This is not an easy game. Um, and while it's, it really was easy for my kids to sit down and start playing it, um, there are very different levels you can play the game on. Uh, and the, the depth of thinking involved to really play the game well mm-hmm. just pushes it into that next level where it is not just a simple, oh, look, let's build something in Minecraft. No, no, you have to plan for the, you know, you're scoring over three rounds. Yeah. To really maximize uh, to do, and it's great because you have to also have to make sure you're trying to stop other people. You know, oh look, they're building this, so you need to make sure if you can to score one of that. You know, score score the one that they're going to need to triple their score, sort of thing. Yeah, there aren't many games that are that strategic, like that you're planning the end game out on your first turn. Yeah, it, it's crazy, and and like Sean said, simple mechanics like mechanically dead simple game what you'd expect from a minecraft game but strategy wise wow that was my builder and biomes um you can tell we're just like ravensburger has put out a lot of good games because we've got another one here and we're gonna we're gonna have a little shout out at the end i think because of this and that is jaws this is one um we just reviewed a couple weeks ago this is another case of a licensed game i expected to not be good as they have not been for years i am certain there's probably a jaws roll and move out there um this is a very neat one versus many board game and it's got elements from like Specter Ops or um, Scotland Yard being the more classic game of one person trying to hide while everyone else is trying to catch them. And then a second part, which is this dramatic battle between the shark and the, the uh, a crew of the boat, uh, recreates some key scenes from the movie, or at least so I'm told, because again, I haven't seen the movie, um, has some really solid hidden movement rules, especially with the shark having um, four abilities they can use that kind of kind of hide their trail. It's just really solid game. I'm not going to go into detail because we just covered this one recently, but I was extremely impressed by how much more of a game this was than I thought it would be for a movie tie-in. Uh, interestingly, I didn't find a roll and move, but there is a 1975 um, sort of uh, taking things from a shark's mouth with a giant oh, molded geez. plastic shark and waiting for the shark to snap, snap down on your fingers sort of okay. thing. Dexterity game. Uh, and that, is, that that one would be uh, is Jaws from 1975, but this is Jaws from 2018. 18 or 19. Uh, I didn't yeah, no, that I, sorry, I should have. I'm, I'm confusing uh, things now. The modern 2019. Jaws. So it's 20. The, the 2019 Ravensburger Jaws uh, again is is a much more deep and uh, really again it's two board games in one on top yeah. of everything else. So that was Jaws 2019 from Ravensburger. Uh, next, Quirkle. Uh, this is one of those mass market games that you can find anywhere. Like you could walk into, well, I guess in the States, there's no more Toys R Us. I don't know what the equivalent toy store is in the States anymore. You walk into a Target or a Walmart and see this game sitting next to all the other games like Trouble and Sorry and stuff like that and probably quickly overlook it. But it is so good. This is basically Scrabble with shapes where instead of having to form rule words, you're matching either the shapes or sorry, not matching the opposite. You're, you're making rows of all the same color or all the same shape and or all different. Like one thing has to match, either the shape or the color in your row. I'm not both because that would duplicate. And you can't make duplicates. And if you can get, I think it's a set of six played out. Quirkle is worth extra points. Scoring is pretty much that Scrabble scoring where you score your row plus anything it's connected to. I This game is the game that I break out when family members come over or when I talk to people playing board games, like, oh, I don't really like hobby board games, or I, I don't like complex games like Catan. That's when I'll break out a game like Quirkle. And that was Quirkle. <laughs> Next, I have a game I had never heard of uh, called Zentico. I had to throw this on the list because I was by Zentico's 
company that makes the game Zentico, and I don't have a designer's name. It says it's designed by Zentico. Maybe that's last name. Uh, they contacted me on Instagram, and this was one of the first games I ever reviewed as the Tabletop Bellhop. And at the time, I was just like, whoa, someone found me. They like us. They're sending us a game. That's cool. So I signed up for it. And then when it showed up, I looked at it and I'm like, what the heck? This is basically like nine men's Morris, right? Like it's you're, you're trying to make a, a row on a grid and you can slide pieces one spot, right? And at first, our first play, I'm like, yeah, it's it's okay. It's it's connect four meets nine men's Morris. That was with two players. But then once we played three player, this game became brilliant. This game is so good. Three player it is an excellent three player experience. Combined with the fact that the production on this is top notch, this is in a uh, whatever PU leather, it's a type of fake leather. So it's in a PU leather case that rolls up and very portable. And this is what I consider now the beach game. This is the game I bring out when my kids are going to a splash pad because nothing in this game can get ruined. It can be dropped in the mud, it can get soaking wet, it starts raining, it's fine. And it is a solid experience. Now, two player, it's it's okay. Uh, like I, I guess it's a step up from tic tac toe, but it's not as good as say playing checkers or chess. It's okay. Uh, you can get to a point where um, you just keep doing the same move back and forth, and no one wins. The game goes on too long. But three player, it is so hard to not make a move that gives someone else the win, and that's where it really shines. Right. Well, that is Zentico. Now, next up, we have the Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. It's a simple family deck building game, uh, but with a ramped up difficulty system that goes from absolute beginner to, oh my God, in about five <laughs> rounds and only keeps scaling up. Uh, so far, we haven't seen the potions uh, expansion, but uh, we know that the monsters, uh, uh, the Monsters Book of Monsters is um crazy i mean it, again we, we have we beat the first one on on monster book of monsters so far but we still haven't uh, managed to break through the second one yet um and again you know it's a co-op so it should be difficult you don't you don't want to be always mm -hmm. succeeding um but the way it takes you through and, and and builds you up adding components and adding aspects to the game uh with each chapter of the book essentially is really a fantastic mechanic uh, that allowed me to bring my my kids, you know, from ever having played anything deck builder at all, to being comfortable playing a pretty heavy, you know, reasonably yeah. heavy heavy deck builder without any problem at all. So, uh, yeah, this one blew me away because it was a good Harry Potter game. Because before that, anything I tried is like we we bought like the Golden Snitch card game, which makes as much sense as Quidditch because you play, but then whoever plays the Snitch wins. And we're like, kind of, why are we playing this game if it just we could just shuffle and whoever gets the Snitch wins and get the same result? Um, and some of the like you would talked about Harry Potter Clue before and just how terrible that is. Yeah. So like I really wasn't expecting much from this, and I gotta admit, like I'm I'm kind of bashing on here, but again, this is from the op. And they were not known for good, nice, heavy, detailed deck builder style games. They were known for making versions of Monopoly and some theme games that at the time weren't so hot. So like the fact you were the one that discovered this one, I probably wouldn't have touched this until you showed it to us. Yeah. And it would also blew me away about this is my daughter taught me how to play. I have never read the rule book for Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. And it's just awesome that my kid taught me to play a game. Yep, absolutely. And that was Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. All right, King Domino is my next one. This is another game I would have overlooked. Uh, I it, it's a it's a hobby game based on dominoes with a fantasy theme. Eh, that that no reason I need to pick this up. But I started to hear positive reviews again. Uh, podcasters talking about it, YouTube content creators going on about how good this game is. And I still wasn't quite sold on it, but we were at an Extra Life event. This goes back a few years. We were at Brimstone Games, one of the local game stores here in Windsor, and just trying to kill time. It was like early Sunday morning, or early Saturday morning. I, I remember being fairly out of it, whatever day it was. It must have been early Sunday morning. And grabbing a demo copy of this they had on their shelves. So I'm like, oh, I heard this is easy, and podcasters are talking about it. And Deanna and I sat down, and we played the first round. And we're like, wow, that, that's kind of neat. I kind of like that. 
like besides the how are you all oh, then the drafting tiles and the order you go in all right let's play again and we played again and then i'm like oh wait the crowns the crowns are huge like man i'm just i'm gonna graft all crowns and then i played the third round and i'm like wait wait you're drafting that if you're drafting that i'm gonna draft this and you get to that evolution of any drafting game right where you go from the worrying about your own stuff to worrying about your opponent's stuff and then that whole do i grab something that's good for me but bad for them we after that third round, I walked over to the shelf, grabbed a copy of King Domino, walked over to the checkout, put their demo copy back, and then opened my shiny new copy and played a fourth round. I am a huge fan of King Domino. Like if you want a lightning quick, like five to ten minute game that really does require tactics and strategy, that there almost is nothing better. And that was King Domino, which reminds me, we need to get another game of that up on uh, board game. Yeah, we could at some point. Maybe we should maybe do a night of uh, King Domino with uh, John. <laughs> yeah, you might be interested in that. All right, this is going to be a shocking one to some people because my next one is going to be a version of Risk. Uh, Risk Star Wars Edition. Uh, if you can find it, this one was dirt cheap for a while. It's a little hard to find now. There is a Black Edition, which I personally think is worth picking up. The Star Wars Risk Black Edition, if not original. And what you expect when you see this box is risk, right? Like, except with a new map. And that is so not what this game is. This is actually a remake and retheme of Queen's Gambit, which is a classic, very well-regarded, a worth a fortune Star Wars game that came out when episode one hit the theaters. This is a modern version of that. And no, not quite as well-regarded as the original, but still very positive because what's happening here is it's a card game where on every card you're going to get to do two things. But the thing is, there are three battles happening at once. And this is set in the Jedi era. There's the space battle up above Endor with the Death Star and the Millennium Falcon and the Calamari cruisers and all the X-Wings and everything battling it out. And I got to admit, that part's very risk-like with rolling D6s to see if you blow up other ships. But then there's also the Han and his team with Leia and Chewie trying to blow up the shield generator on Endor with the uh, other player playing the Stormtroopers. And then you also have Luke having a lightsaber battle with Darth Vader in front of the Emperor. And that is more of a push and pull track. So, you know, you're, you start, the pawn starts in the middle, but if you play a plus two for Luke, it moves one way and then it moves the other. And you're doing, you're fighting on three fronts at once, but you can only ever affect two fronts at a time. And you get a hand of five cards and there's predicting what your opponent's doing. Like for a game with the word risk on the cover, it just amazing. Now I'll admit it's not the best game in the world. Like I'm, I, I'm, I'm not trying to oversell it. It's not the next Twilight Imperium. It's not Star Wars. Um, what's the big Star Star Wars Battalion or Battle? What's I can't remember the big Star Wars game that everyone Battlefleet? loves. Battlefleet. Battle. That doesn't sound right either. What is the big Star Wars Rebellion? That's it. Star Wars Rebellion, the big Star Wars in a box game. You're not getting that. This is still a lighter game. This is one I can play with my kids. It's still mass market Hasbro, but compared to pretty much every other edition of risk ever made this blows it away all right well that was star wars risk edition now is there a what is the difference between the star wars risk edition and the star wars a risk star wars edition and risk star wars original trilogy edition do you know the original trilogy edition is risk with oh a it's just map. risk okay it's it's a variant of risk of right so we are looking for over risk the gonna be called risk, a star wars edition star wars edition <laughs> Yes, I know. And and there's also Star Wars, the Clone Wars Risk, and there's others. This is Risk colon Star Wars Edition, which is in a red box, and there is the Black Edition, which is, it's got better card quality. You actually get a miniature for the Millennium Falcon and the Death Star. It's, it's, it, it's just quality improvements, a really nice box insert, which is something you don't expect from Hasbro. The Black Edition, if you can find it, is definitely worth it. That's what I own. Right. And that was and then, Risk, Star Wars, sorry, Risk Star Wars Edition. <laughs> Sticking with mass market games, we have Blockus. Uh, this is another one you're going to find on the shelf next to games like Don't Step On It and Pimple Pete. Um, this is a puzzle game where you're using polyominoes to fill in a grid. And the brilliant part in this is the way, the shape of the tiles, the number of tiles you get, how many tiles will fit on the board, and the fact that when you place you at the pace, so your tiles only touch diagonally which lets your opponent sneak in on the other corners, basically. This is, uh, you're trying to play all of your tiles before any of your opponents. 
this game is way deeper than you would ever think. Like this is a tactical strategic game. You're counting pieces, you're, uh, you're backstabbing your partners, you're, you're cutting people off. Like Blockus to me is up there with games like the Duke and chess. And like, I, I love this game. This is something playing two players. You be, be, the only disadvantage I would say is two player, you play two colors, which is okay. Three players. There's a fake third, fourth player, which is kind of weird where every turn someone has to put it. But if you can get a four player game of Blockus going, it is fantastic. All right. Well, that was Blockus. Now, next up, Ticket to Ride, New York. Neither of us are really fans of Ticket to Ride. Yet, however, despite that, this short, succinct version ended up being a really solid, especially two-player game. But it does work up to four players. And it's just enough to scratch that train game itch, but it doesn't overstay its welcome. Uh, I mean, it's. I think the first time we sat down to play it, from opening the box to finishing the game was like 20, maybe 25 yeah. minutes uh, without ever having, you know, looked at inside the box before. Mm-hmm. And, and no, I know, agree. it's, it's that fun bit, but you, it doesn't overstay its welcome. Like a game of ticket to ride. Ken. Yeah. I, I, this was a huge surprise to me. I think I got it as a gift. Like I can't even think of why I own ticket to ride New York. Yeah. It was, I it was a gift was... you got from one of your family members. Yeah. Pretty sure. Which is fair. They yeah. probably found it at chapters, right? And and fair enough. But yeah, I, I actually love this game. Like it's, it's just, it's got that it's cutthroat. We usually play two, three games in a row. Once you know the game, it's like 10 minutes. The other thing is my kids can play this one, including my youngest, who has difficulty learning games. And the fact I can play this with my girls is fantastic. And it's a great next step, right? Like now that I've got them hooked on that, the next time we have a Christmas Eve party, I could now have them play Ticket to Ride, which we've done with the oldest. So yeah, I was extremely impressed by Ticket to Ride New York. And I have to assume the other city games that are calling it now, the city series are just as good. Yeah, London, I know, was the other one. There's London, now there's a newer one too that's out that includes some of the rules from Europe, which where you you can push your luck to try to go through tunnels. i really impressed by that. Like, I again, I would have never bought that. Like, that was a gift and I was like, eh, let's give it a shot. I'm like, wow, this is is good. Amsterdam, thank you, Everyday Board Game. And that was Ticket to Ride New York. All right, Homeland the Game. This one is totally a hidden gem. This is one of my my strongest recommendations to pick up in this episode for people who like a certain style of game. Now, I know nothing about the series. I, I know it's a U.S., the whatever, Department of Homeland Security versus terrorist thing, but that's about it. I've never seen the show. I am not American. It doesn't, I, I you know, 911 happened. That sucks, but it didn't happen to my country. So I'm not tied to the events in this game. So I am just looking at it from a mechanical standpoint. And this is a fantastic hidden role game. Um, and I am not a fan of social deduction, so there, there's another thing saying this. This one you can usually find cheap, and what I love about this one is there's the good guys, right? There's Homeland Security, and they are trying to prevent terrorist actions happening, and if they prevent enough of them, they win the game. And you have the terrorists who are trying to, ter- to, to conduct terrorist activities, and if they do enough ter- 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 uh, can't even say it, terrorist activities, they win the game. Great. There's your two factions, right? And you don't know who's who. But then there is also the media faction. And what they want, and I think there's a brilliant commentary on the media, is that they want some terrorist plots to happen because you want ratings, but not too many. And they end up winning the game if there's a balance. And it, like this to me, and it uses the skill point system where you're playing skill cards into a pile and then you shuffle them and reveal to see if the thing succeeded or failed and there's things where you can bring in army troops and stuff. If you like Battlestar Galactica, which to me is still one of my favorite games of all time, without that chance that someone's going to roleplay their character and screw it up, and without it taking six hours, check out Homeland. Like It is a really solid, hidden trader style game. And that was Homeland, the game. Now, another TV series tie-in is Sons of Anarchy. Uh, Sons of Anarchy, the board game. This is another one you can usually find cheap. Both Homeland and Sons of Anarchy, I think, expected to do well based on the licenses. They printed too many copies. I don't know. I don't know why it's available so cheap. Uh, This is the District 19 of my list. I hadn't played the District 19 game that Prayerborn mentioned. Well, District 12. 
District 12, sorry. See, again, I don't watch these things or read these things. Actually, I did watch some movies. Anyway, the, the Hunger Games game, being a Euro, that this is this. This is Sons of Anarchy, the board game, is a worker placement game where you're going to send your bikers to different spots on the board, like strip clubs and dive bars, and collect resources like guns and contraband. I like I would have never pegged Sons of Anarchy to be a medium weight euro with auction mechanics and bluffing elements. Like this is a solid game. Uh for people who dig the mechanics, it has been rethemed to a Dungeons and Dragons theme, uh, which I totally should have put in notes. Is it Dragonfire or is it one of the other DD games? There is a DD retheme of this if you don't like the whole biker gangs and guns and contraband. Uh, you can pick that up. Vault of Dragons, I think it's called. Vault of Dragons, yes. Yes, Vault of Dragons. Took me a second. I got it before <laughs> anyone types it in the chat. Oh, no one has. Yeah, Vault of Dragons is a Dungeons & Dragons update version of it. It's seriously good game. Like, if you like the theme. Personally, that theme, I'm not going to play that with my kids, right? Whereas I'll play the D&D one. But I was, again, shocked. Like, someone convinced me, that, like, you got to buy this. I'm like, I'm like, it's a $5 game. How can it be good? Plus, it's Sons of Anarchy, which I've never seen, and I don't care about biker gangs. I'm no biker. I might be a big guy with long hair and a beard, but I don't ride a bike. I don't have tattoos. But sit down and play this like, oh, no, it's like a solid Euro. You're like, oh, I'm going to go here and collect the guns, and I'm going to go here. And you have these scenes where you're bidding, and you have to actually like, reveal your hand. And I'm like, like real Euro mechanics. Well, I mean, to be fair, Gale Force 9 does do Tyrants of the Underdark, Firefly yep. the game. You know, they've... They've got a, a, a good uh, a good solid base on which to build a True. game about bikers and <laughs> But that was Sons of Anarchy from Gale Force Nine. All right, this is one Deanna suggested I put on the list and I had to agree with her when she she came up with it, and that is Hey That's My Fish. Uh this looks like a silly kids game. It's by Fantasy Flight, which is a good indication it's not. But like this could have easily been a blue orange or a hobby game, in my opinion, with um a bunch of hex tiles with one to three fish on them. And depending on the edition, you have very cute looking penguins of some type, whether they're plastic, whether they're meeple or whatever. I per mine personally have meeple. And you, you lay out the board. All you do on your turn is you're going to move your penguin in a straight line as far as it can go. And then you get to keep the tile it moved off of. The thing is, the tile you're picking up is the board. So as you're playing, the board, the ice sheet, is getting smaller and smaller. And it's all about planting ahead and making sure you get the good three fish tiles. And most importantly, cutting your opponents off. That is a big part of the game. Uh, you got a good combination of strategic plates, planning ahead, and tactics of reacting to how your opponents play. This is, again, it's one of those almost chess-like games when you sit down with people who know how to play. Yeah, and that was, hey... That's my fish. Next up, The Climbers, which is not actually a dexterity game. Yeah. It looks like a dex game. You shouldn't play it while drunk. It's got little markers and blocks and ladders that all move throughout the game, but it's not a dex game. You just happen to need a little bit more than drunken dexterity in order to manage what is actually a complex game about movement and paths and blocking your opponents in a limited and ever-changing spatial layout yeah i dig games that make you think spatially and that's what the climbers does like it, the, one of the big indicators that game's not just a silly dex game it's put out by capstone games capstone like put out heavy games and i'm like what the heck is this block stacking game that was another one i heard from podcasters and i'm like i gotta try this and it's so good and that was The Climbers. Uh, interestingly, they put out a family edition of that one. Uh, just last, I have not seen that. Just last year, uh, there, there's a Climbers family edition. I'm not sure what uh, what the difference is, but it's uh, uh, with fewer no components. Clue. No ladders, no blocking still, cubes. Still probably. accommodating two to five players. Hmm. Uh, but with less com fewer components how odd interesting hmm. again that was the climbers next a big heavy meaty game that i really was not expecting to be big heavy or meaty and that is dungeon lords when i saw this game from check games edition and the picture with the little minion on the cover i thought i was getting a board game version of dungeon lords the computer game or not dungeon lords that's the name of the board game what is it? dungeon keeper Dungeon Keeper, the computer game, which is a game all about digging the right tunnels and abusing your 
your little goblin and dropping things into pits to get more monsters and it's, it's almost an action game like there's strategy but it's 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 an action silly over the top game dungeon lords is one of the heaviest games i own it is a game that the designer, I think it's Isaac Childress. No, uh, Vlada Shavato. Sorry, I think it's Vlada Shavato. Yeah, Vlada. Uh, give, gives you a number of tutorials to play through and explain how monsters work and how the rooms work and how to play out when the heroes raid your dungeon. And it's complex enough that Vlada actually says, now that you play through this tutorial, ask the players who have played through it if they still want to play because this game is not for anyone, everyone. That is literally in the rule book, and that is what this game is like. This is heavy, meaty. Like you tried to play it with us on, I think you gotta. Yeah, and the 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 interface and not having not having actually sat down and and gone through things made that one just. I mean, oh. it's a three and a half on on BGA or BGG. Yeah, uh, it's not that heavy. It feels heavier than many other games. Yeah. Well, it, three and a half isn't exactly light. That's yes, you know. Yeah, that that the surprise here, like this was, it, I knew it would be. It's it's a games edition, right? Like I expect relative heaviness there. Like they made Pulsar, but I wasn't expecting twice as heavy as Pulsar. Yep. So that was Dungeon Lords. All right, a game we talk about far too often on the show. It seems I don't know why it just seems to come up every episode lately. Is Chocolatiers from Daily Magic Games. Now, this was one, the only reason I took it is I love Daily Magic Games. I have been hooked on their games since discovering them at Origins 2015, 2016, one of those, uh, when Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria was brand new. And I am just a fanboy of them. So I went to their booth at Origins, and I literally, I fanboyed out for a while, and I said, I will take every game that I have not played here and bring it home and review it for you. And the main one I was hoping to get at the time was Horizons, as well as a couple packs for Valeria I didn't have yet. And with that, they gave me this game Chocolatiers in a small box. I'm like, okay, sure. The next morning, Deanna and I are sitting at the uh, the restaurant in the hotel, and I brought that with me to, to look at the rules while we're having breakfast. And I opened it up, and I'm looking, and I'm like, what what is this? Like, it's it's a box of chocolates game, and they spent so much money. They put UV coating on the chocolates to make them shiny. Like, And then I started reading the rules, and I'm like, okay. So it's ticket to ride because I'm trying to graph chalk, like I'm trying to get sets of colors or sets of chocolates to play to put a tableau in front of me. And I, okay, sure. Oh, well, I, I, I guess I, I got a copy of Horizons to check out. <laughs> then we actually didn't play it. Like I, I had no interest in trying it at Origins. Didn't break it out until weeks later here back at Windsor. And we played the first game. And that's a game where we talked about before that has Eureka moments where you're playing and suddenly you're like, oh, wait where which which one i'm drafting that one's like there's there's a situational positioning the thing same thing i liked in climbers aspect of building your chocolate box and then there's the whole thing we've talked about before about with um any drafting game you go through that evolution of i only care about my stuff oh i care about my opponents and then i have to worry about everyone's stuff so there's that aspect of it and then there's the being able to gain cards and then in fact you realize the count of the card the deck is a huge part that certain like some chocolates are more rare than others right and it just from what i expected the game to be it was so much better like the the set collection elements were better the tableau building was better the having to watch your opponents was key it was definitely not multiplayer uh solitaire i i was kind of blown away by just how solid this game was and that was chocolatiers all right one of my kids games that i play more than you and have more Going off to other people is back cheap. This is a blue orange game game that I actually think should be marketed at adults, like rethemed somehow. Because I, I, the kids at least the age we shot them to have just didn't get the brilliance of this game. Uh, this is similar to Hey That My Fish in a way, except that you have your your hex grid, and it's just laid out like you have it set at the beginning, and then you have a huge pile of almost poker chip like cheap these are these are really nice chips i don't know they're not poker chips they're green plastic i don't know exactly what they are and what you're going to do is you're going to take any number from that stack and move in a straight line and put that stack down and then your opponent's going to do that and you're going to keep splitting your piles trying to take over the, as much of the board as possible 
And it's all about cutting people off and, and making sure you don't get yourself cut off. Like if you have a pile of seven sheep and that gets cut off, you, you're going to lose. There's no way you're going to get those sheep out. So you see them going for your pile of seven. So you run six of those seven across the board. Really neat game that's all about splitting up these pile of sheep. That, Like I said, I, I swear this would sell better marketed to adults with some kind, I don't know what adult theme, but put a Star Wars theme on it where you're spending stormtroopers around Moss Eisley or something. And it, it would do better than it would now because the kids just, they, they want to play with it. The kids love this as a toy. They love the the sheep pieces. They love the the the, the chips or whatever the, the sheep are made out of. But I, like I, maybe I should try it again with them now that they're older. But the only reason they kept it is they like playing with the pieces. And I think now, maybe now that they're in their teens, they, they'll, they'll appreciate Battle Sheep for what it is. And that was Battle Sheep. All right, I got one more here. I wasn't going to, I didn't have this one on the list, but earlier today I was checking out the awesome Everyday Board Games uh, podcast being recorded here on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Everyday Board Games. And the Daniels were talking about games with table presence and they brought up photosynthesis. And I was like, ooh, I need to throw that one in there because that is a game that completely surprised me by how heavy it is how thinky it is and how much, how strategic, how much you have to plan ahead. Now, this is a blue orange game. So when I see blue orange games, I think light games. I don't expect anything heavy from like Battleship's surprisingly good, but it's still like kids could figure it out. Photosynthesis is all about planting trees with these amazing 3D cardboard trees that you build. And the whole thing is you plant your trees and the sun moves around the board and there's three different heights. It's either three or four. It's been a while since I played this one. Three or four different heights of trees and they provide shade depending on where the sun is. And if your tree's in shade, it doesn't grow. Where if it's in the sun, it's going to grow. And then eventually your trees are going to produce seedlings and the seedlings are going to go out. And you got to put those seedlings in the way of the wind. Like there's just this whole planning ahead for where the sun's going to be and trying to make shade for your opponent's trees while keeping your trees in the sun and honestly it was so much heavier than i thought that i did not enjoy my first couple of plays because it's just not what i wanted and to be honest we are on our honeymoon and we are in the brewer's suite at a brewery out in the county and we had had a few drinks and photosynthesis is not a game you want to play after a few drinks and it on a, uh, in a way left a bad taste in my mouth. It was so different than what I expected. And I feel bad. What I need to do, I still own it, is I need to give this game a chance and sit down expecting it to be as heavy as it is and, and play it with people expecting that. The other thing, too, is I was thinking fast, and this is not a fast game. This is an AP-prone, slow-thinky game, not a quick plants and trees game. Yeah, that was photosynthesis and i think one thing i think as we're wrapping this up that that really comes to mind is a lot of these games that have surprised us have a couple of things in common and that is companies that have really exceeded our original expectations or original feelings about them uh from usaopoly becoming the op and mm. really delivering a fabulously stronger collection of games in general oh yeah uh, that that surprise us from a game that from a company that just used to put out different version of Monopoly, Pretty much. Um, and and now that they have rebranded, they didn't just rebrand to hide themselves. They rebranded because they're putting out new content, uh, and that that's really impressive. They're not just trying to hide the fact that they make mm -hmm. Monopoly games. They're saying, no, look, we're this company now, and look at what we can put out. I think it's time that we should probably actually stop being surprised by the great quality that they're putting out. And similarly with Ravensburger, now mm -hmm. unfortunately Prospero Hall isn't going to be doing any more Ravensburger stuff. No, they still, they put something out for them just this year. Uh, so. Interesting. Yeah, well, that, 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 it may be, that may be a long-term thing. Yeah. But given, given the whole relationship with Funko and, and everything, mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see. But I think, uh, you know, Ravensburger isn't just that, uh, you know, the Jigsaw Puzzle Company anymore. Yeah. They were known for kids' games. They have put out a number of fantastic kids' games for years now. Labyrinth, Magic Labyrinth, those are amazing. Um, Enchanted Forest. They were known for good kids' games, and that hasn't changed. But yes, they are now doing solid licensed games. Though I still think out of all of this, if you look through our list, there's a name that comes up multiple times. We didn't say it every time. And that is Prospero Hall. 
I am amazed by what this production company has done. Now, maybe you're like me. We didn't realize that we thought Prospero Hall was a person. It is not. It is a an in-house game design company that is part of the Funko team. They are a division of Funko. Um, they did the Funko Pop games. They did Disney Villainous. They did Jaws. They did Back to the Future. They did like, like almost every good uh, the Wonder Woman mass game. Mass market game. Uh, yeah, the the Wonder the Wonder Woman game. Yeah, uh, uh, Minecraft builders and biomes yeah. we mentioned earlier. Uh, like they are just honestly knocking it out of the park. Like like if if Prospero Hall was a person, they'd be a Stephen Feld to <laughs> me at this point. Yeah. Like I am almost at the point where I want to try everything they make. Like it is they make such good games. Horrified we villainous earlier. Villainous, yeah, Disney villainous. Like like villainous, I think might have been their first big hit. That, uh, yeah, that was, was that was that was what I think what everyone got got on everyone's radar at least. Yeah. So yeah, just really impressed by Prospero Hall. So they follow us online. Maybe they listen to the show or someone from them listened to the show. But big shout out to them for, for making mass market and because a lot of these are target exclusives now. So mass market games and licensed games are actually good. Um I, I it's amazing in a way to me <laughs> compared to so many years. Like I have been I've been playing games since the eighties, technically probably since the seventies, you count. My, my kids games and like licensed games was a bad thing like if a game had said star wars on it you bought it because it said star wars not because it's going to be good or if it said indiana jones or or et like there right. is not a good et game there you go hey prospero hall or restoration games how about an indiana jones or a, a, a et nowadays i don't think anyone cares <laughs> indiana jones would be cool though so yeah, that's a that's a shout out that that's our that's our honorable mention basically. Every game made by Prospero Hall until you realize they're all good is going to surprise you for a while. Yep. Uh, and yet again, they've got you know the Pop Tarts game coming out. They've got uh, Disney yeah, Haunted Mansion, Disney Haunted Mansion, Hocus on, Pocus, uh, yeah, uh, Disney Jungle Cruise Adventure. Um, you know, there's a The Shining is even a <laughs> they've even got uh, Top Gun, which was mm -hmm. maybe not their most standout game from what I've seen, but still had some solid aspects in it. I mean, it's one of the few volleyball board games. There you go. Yeah. People are going nuts right now online for Pan Am. Yeah. A lot of people are going nuts for Pan Am right now. I did a demo of um, Hocus Pocus, really neat co-op game that is honestly like an improvement on Go Fish of all things, where you're trying to get all your potion ingredients to match either the color or the symbol, but you're allowed to ask your opponents one question every round, like, Hey, do you have any eye of newt? But that's all you're allowed to ask, and you have to play based on it. That was really neat. Um, oh, just I, I did enough. Prospero Hall definitely big thumbs up for everything they've been doing. Actually, I didn't realize they actually did some Zed Man games. Choose your own adventure stuff. Uh, they did the War with the Evil Power Master, uh, oh, based off the, the old R.A. Montgomery book. Yeah, the the Which Way book one. Yeah. So I didn't know that was them either. I haven't tried any of those games. All right, so there you have a number of games that surprised us. Now let's head over to the lobby and see if anyone our chat in our chat room has anything to add. I saw quite a bit going through, quite a bit going through. So yeah. one correction, it was it was our anniversary, not honeymoon. I thought <laughs> I said anniversary. I guess not. So I'm gonna have to scroll back here because there's a lot. Um, Amsterdam, I, we got was as the uh, the newest of the city games for the ticket to ride. Yeah. So it's uh, New York, London, Amsterdam. Uh, oh, and apparently, check out the uh, Board Game Geek for uh, Star Wars Risk as the designer did some rule tweaks to uh, just oh. improve it even more. That's good to know. Yeah, a lot of people didn't know about the Sons of Anarchy re-theme. A lot of people missed that the Vault of Dragons is is a re-theme with D&D, &D, right. which is kind of cool. Uh, uh, Dungeon Keeper got some Dungeon Keeper love. Uh, some people do prefer Sons of Anarchy over D and D, which is perfectly legit. Absolutely, and there's nothing wrong with you know if if it was it was a solid series. It didn't really do anything for me. It's not my my kind of TV, but uh, you know I know my wife loved it. I know tons of people were massive fans of yeah, that. Yeah, to show. be honest, it's it's in my queue actually because I I just finished Hell on Wheels and I was thinking of moving over to that as the next AMC series I watch. Right. Uh, Dungeon Lords Pets. I've never played. I have heard that's good. Uh, I don't know if that was something that was a surprise or not. Uh, supposedly, it's good for the poo cutes. Oh, unfortunately, I'm seeing bits of chat that I think were replies to stuff we said. <laughs> so I'm yeah. not sure. Battleship popular. All right. Well, I'm looking through these. What game surprised you, chat room? What games 
you didn't expect. Yeah, a lot of love. G keeping it sexy. There we go. That was another one of those, uh, another one of the Prospero Hall ones, because they also did Bob uh, Bob Ross as well, right? Yep. Marvel yep. villainous. So. So everyday board games. Uh, one Shobu. Of the Daniels says Shobu. Shobu. Is it? Shobu yeah. looks. Good. That's the one with the white and the black. And when you move on one side, you have to move on the other. I think that's the one. That looks really good. That is on the Deanna. This. Uh, we love the Duke and War Chest and that style of game. It's huge for us for date nights when we we go out. Yeah, it's actually ranked thirty on Abstract Games right now on Board Game Geek. Yeah, it's the one I was thinking of. Oh, it's Smirk and Dagger. I have a contact there. Well, there you go. Although we oh, kind of Smirk and up. Laughter, not Smirk and Dagger. They're the same company. Okay. It's one side's their backstabbing games, and one uh, side's their party games. All right. Okie dokie. That's not one I know. Pretty thinky, but very cute. Better than most Abstract. We are gonna have to check that one out. card game for the queen i don't i don't call for the queen a card game i call that an rpg but yes that is definitely <laughs> a go-to for grown-ups who've never played an rpg i could see that for the queen i'm a big fan of yep. i played that with uh danielle who we we gamed with the other day unmatched i missed that one so unmatched because they played funko verse and thought it would be the same yeah they are not <laughs> funko verse <laughs> yeah. and unmatched are very different uh funko verse all about card management as well as positioning I or sorry, yeah, unmatched. The Funko games really did shock me. I I don't feel the need to need, own them. I like miniature war gaming. For me, I just jumped to like Warhammer um, Shade Spire, which you and I played there with the the corn yeah. berserkers versus like that's more my style of skirmish war game. Uh Quartor Corridor. Corridor is a good one. I haven't played Corto, but Corridor is one that could have been on my list. I just forgot about it. I don't own it. My dad owned a copy and I don't know where it went. Like he might have lent it to someone. That's one of those games that you used to buy at like the men's store that just like you leave out on your coffee table. It's made of solid wood. Right. And it's all trying to get your pawn to the other of um the board, but every turn you're gonna put a wall. So it's wall off the opponent while trying to make a path for yourself. Right. It's fantastic. Quartos, uh, if I remember correctly, is a match four but with stacking. That's a good one. Uh, Twitter earlier, random scrub said tiny towns looks like an adorable light puzzle, but ended up completely melting my brain. And I got to agree. Tiny towns is heavier than you'd think. Like the, the positioning um, town center is one I thought about putting on the list, but I knew it was going to be as brain burning as it is when I bought it. But you look at it and again, it looks like a block stacking game, but it's, it's that one where you're positioning uh, residential units and hotels and the things grow organically based on what they're next to and that one breaks my brain every time i love it but i played with so many people that hate it interesting one i'm one that keeps pop, uh, popping up in my head tonight uh, but i haven't played in so long that i can't actually remember was drop it that we played at uh oh, QCC. Yeah. I, I don't know if that surprised it was it was exactly what i thought it would be and it was well, awesome see to me for me the 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 complexity of the rules, right? The interaction of all the different things you can't do is really yeah. what made that game stand out where it seems like it's a silly little, uh, you know, a silly little sort of dexterity connect four. But then you start thinking about oh. the levels of, of rules and things you can't do well, in yeah, order to score a point. You can't have the same symbol touch or the same color and then there's some on the edges. Yeah, yeah. The biggest surprise for me in that one was how the pieces move. But I wouldn't say it's a huge shock, like I'd throw it on the list, but I was surprised just the physics of that game and how slippery things were. Yep. Things did not move how I expected them to move. Indeed. And actually, that's one that could have gone on the sh on the uh, the Everyday Board Games show today, too, because like, that actually has some yeah, good table presence. That is some good table presence. Uh, Ryan Town Center, you could definitely do it. With blindness, well, you'd, you'd have to be really good at spatial recognition in your head, but you could easily somehow have another player tell you what color your cubes are or add something to the cube so you can touch it. The problem is you need to pull them from a blank randomly, but once they're out, it's just drafting. So you could, I, I think you could, as long as you could visualize the actual board with the cubes on them, I, with help, I think you could definitely play that one. I love town center, but like I, Oh wait, Neil is a heavy gamer. Neil likes heavy games. Neil likes flippy game uh, or uh, likes, likes, heavy strategy games likes pvp neil's one of the heavy gamers in the area and it's from um company that does heavy games normally and so i taught it to neil and neil this almost flipped the table he rage quit he literally left in the middle of the game 
and and went out for a smoke and went home like he didn't come back and we're like I, that game pissed him off that much for him just not getting how it worked and getting frustrated with it and that is the reaction i've gotten with town center i dig it but I, I I almost I might get rid of my copy because I've I haven't found like four locals to play it with who all like it. Right. Paris La City et la Lumière. I don't know that one. It's a 2019 game from uh Devere Games, although a, a ton of other different people. Uh players compete for their moment in the light by placing oddly shaped building tiles. That sounds cool. You had another poly- polyominoes are the thing. No one seemed to notice that. Everyone noticed everyone's doing rolling rights. Everyone's doing polyominoes. Yes. Yeah, Copenhagen. You got all the A- action terms. drafting, area majority influence, drafting tile placement. Polyominoes exploded in the last little while. All right. I think we probably got enough. Um, one uh, at Shobu I had in the notes for <laughs> Danielle, but hey, Daniel's in the chat, so I didn't have to say that one. There we go. The Grizzled. I see the Grizzled was about what I expected. The Grizzled is a really good game. That is a cooperative game. The art is amazing. Uh the tie-in to uh Je suis Charlie, is it? It's been a long time since that happened. A, a really neat game, but to me it didn't surprise me in any way. I was just like, wow, yep, this is good. Yep. All right. Oh, there we go. Finally. Before we move on, remember always, if you've got a game or game night question for us, a topic to cover, like surprisingly complex games, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or just email questions, tabletopbellhop.com. 